Hey there, my name is Andrew Brustansky and I'm a professional photographer based in Montreal and today we're going to be talking about my experiences over the last five years with the Leica M10. So I bought this camera from Camtech in 2017 after window shopping for a few months, starting with like a Q, falling in love with that build quality and that feel, and then realizing that I should just start looking at the Leica M's. And then I actually ordered the M10 without even ever seeing one or playing with one. I just played with the M240 and I knew that I just had to try this one out because it just has everything I wanted and it still does. So my history, my background is actually with Sony. I started shooting Sony back in 2008, actually, with the Alpha mount, and then I worked my way into the NEXs, and then I got the first A7, and then afterwards the A7R2, and yada, 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 but I was very used to shooting manual focus lenses, and when I switched into the M system, I actually sold all my autofocus lenses, and I just fully immersed myself with manual focus lenses, so if you're hesitant on, or you're debating on whether or not it's you're, you you're capable of shooting a manual focus lens primarily as or using an M even as your main camera body. Well, this video is for you because I'll tell you right away. I've been using this camera for five years now and I'm not turning back. So this is just an instant way to immediately master your skills as a uh, Leica or just a rangefinder user. It's immediate and the viewfinder on this thing is spectacular. It's the best of any Leica M camera. I don't care what you say. If you haven't tried an M10, then you don't know what you're missing because the viewfinder on this thing is amazing. It is humongous, it's bright, it's clear, it's contrasty. So I got this camera and I immediately started shooting weddings with it. Literally the first week I had this camera, I brought it to a wedding. So I bought a Zeiss Distagon, 35 millimeter f1.4. Before I even got the M10, I even got a Metabones adapter and put it on my Sony's just to get a feel for it. And this lens is amazing. If you've watched my videos or even seen any other reviews, really, this is a lens to definitely consider. But this lens paved the way and opened the floodgates to the incredible image quality that you can get out of the M10. So that's one of the things that I was a little bit hesitant about when I got the M10 because I was used to shooting 42 megapixels with these Sony cameras. And so 24 was kind of already a little bit... Uh, I don't know how to call it, I guess of a downgrade, but I don't want to see that because 24 is really all you need and this camera kind of reaffirmed that for me. Um, the files that the M10 produces are super, super, super rich. If you use Lightroom, for example, when you import your images, make sure to change your color profile to the Leica M10 profile because you'll get an extra juicy, beautiful, dynamic image quality that you won't get when you use, let's say, Adobe Colors. The files are very much, I would, I would compare them to like Kodak Ektar or, or maybe Ektachrome. It, it, it's just like a very punchy, uh, low ISO film feel to them. If you've played with these files, you know what I'm talking about. The, it, it feels like a daylight tuned film. And that reflects into when you use this camera in low light because the colors kind of get very yellow and chalky. I've mentioned that in my other videos as well. If you use the Leica M10 color profile, be wary of their low light performance. It can give you a desired effect if you want it to, or if not, but just switch it back to Adobe for low light if you really, if you really want to just be clinical. But I like it, it's playful, and it really reminds me of when you shoot daylight film indoors at night, when you're shooting the M10 indoors at night. So the image quality is fantastic. Make sure that you shoot it at ISO 200. When the M10 came out in 2017, if you would shoot it on auto ISO, the ISO uh, would start at a base of 100, which was actually uh, pulling the base ISO because the real base ISO of this sensor, I think it's like 125 or 160, I don't recall. And it's realistically closer to 200. And then they later on changed it with a form firmware update to ISO 200 to remedy the clipped highlights that a lot of users are complaining about. If you're shooting at 100, it's very risky. You have to always underexpose with this camera. I always underexpose it to negative 0.7 stops. You can do that by programming your um, programmable button right here in the front. So if you have an M10, just make sure to shoot at ISO 200. 
the files it produces are very saturated, very punchy. Obviously it depends on the lenses you use, but I find the M sensors just really take out all that what you want and you need from any M mount lens that you put it on, that you use it with. So a B50 Sumilux, for example, just shines on the M10 sensor, as does the 35 Distagon that I started out with. The Distagon, when I switched from the Sony system to the M system in 2017, the Distagon really, I guess, almost gave me a false representation of what the system is because this lens really, really brought out every little pixel on the M10. It's focusing with this rangefinder is so easy, it's so fast, it's, it's not like using focus peaking on a mirrorless camera. It's actually way quicker because all you're doing is you're matching up images together. And because of the layout of the camera, it's entirely haptic. Everything you do, you just feel married to the camera. It's very, very engaging. There's nothing to think about. It sounds like a gimmick, but it really isn't. Nothing is as easy and as fast to use as a Leica M when it comes to manual focusing. So this system here, I would always get my shots much quicker than I would get with any other mirrorless system because, for example, when you're using focus magnification and focus peaking with a, with a mirrorless camera like my Sony a7R2s, you're always stuck magnifying to the to 200%, let's say, just to guarantee that you're in focus. Whereas with the M10, with that rangefinder patch full of the contrast, you just match it up and maybe you wiggle the lens back and forth real quick to get a little bit of a confirmation, but it's so fast. It, it, just try one of these cameras out and you know exactly what I mean. And the M10 is a fantastic way to just break through the, the training wheels immediately because you're getting instant results when you look at the screen in the back and you're always reaffirmed whenever you look at a shot. Whereas with a film camera, you know, you have to wait till you develop and everything like that. So I found I, I'm, I don't want to say mastered, but I definitely got really, really damn good at using the rangefinders with the M10 thanks to the immediacy of the results. And I've come to become, it's become such a second nature camera to use for me that I can shoot from the hip so easily. I know when I'm in focus, I, you feel it, especially with if you have a lens with a focus tab, you know it doesn't make sense. You know, when you're focusing, you, you, you become so engaged with the camera that you know that there's no way that that person is without even looking at your distance scale on your lens you know just by feeling the lens that no that guy's definitely further than two meters away and the minimum focusing distance although most of the time with these lenses they're at one meter or 0.7 meters sounds like a drawback but it's actually uh, an, uh, an aid when it comes to manual focusing because when you start getting to closer distances, most lenses have to really increase their focus throw to give you a little bit more precision. So the throw is pretty consistent throughout its range and you're not stuck with that weird, awkward, you know, like let's say extra half a turn of the lens barrel to make sure that you're between 0.3 meters and 0.7 or 0.5 and 0.7. So what that enables you to do is know that you're where you are in your travel and you don't have to second guess your focusing as much. So the, the fact that you have less distance to cover throughout your focusing makes manual focusing with these lenses another level easier. So all in all, I find this is just the best way to get yourself into the M system and immerse yourself into manual focusing fast. And I, I've come to really appreciate that with the M10. So now let's talk about the build quality of the camera because after five years, I'm sure a lot of people are curious about uh, how it really held up to the task. It, well, it did. Uh, this is me, and I'm not exaggerating it, using this camera every single day. It's always strung around my neck, around my waist, banging against my jackets, banging against me, banging against things. <laughs> and I can recall every single time I hit it hard against something because you feel it <laughs> when it's something this expensive. You try to be careful with it and I tend I like to say that I take care of my gear but you know accidents do happen in the fields so I've got a few little nicks here and there but nothing major nothing completely warping the metal uh, like for example I smacked the corner of so I smacked actually the corner of the top plate against my watch at one point when I was doing a wedding I felt that so there's like a nice little shiny part right here now what else is there? Dragging it through between a car window, scratched a bit on the edge here. But the finish is really holding up on this camera, I gotta say. 
otherwise little 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 tiny scratches here and there but they're all superficial nothing's really going to damage it and the black chrome finish on this camera is so beautiful and i only notice the wear when i look at pictures that i've taken of the camera when i first got it because when you first get it you really notice okay it's much more flat black now it's got a little bit of a nice you know holographic kind of shine to it, it looks fantastic and in different various lighting situations you see the, the the patina of the camera so my turning it on and off has definitely silvered the finish just a bit but this looks a lot better than let's say the finish of an m6 or something like that where you start to see the silvering much quicker uh, no strap wear for me not too much to speak of there's a bit i use the leather strap plug covers that come with the straps that i buy Otherwise, no scratches on the screen, which I'm very surprised by because I thought I would have for sure scratched this thing. And I have a cover for the screen that I put on the very first day I got it. I still have the spare one. I didn't even have to replace this one. Um, the wear and tear is actually fantastic. I haven't hit metal, and I'm not joking when I say I use this camera every day. So, you know, little taking good care of your camera goes a long way with these cameras because I find personally it doesn't really look like I've used it for the amount of time that I've used it for. So a few uh, things to note, the M10 does have the louder shutter of the M series. So the M10 had the loudest shutter, then the M10P when it came out had the quieter shutter, and then every single M that came after that, M10, and the M10s and now the M11, they're all quiet. Uh, the, the sound on the shutter isn't really intrusive. It's not that loud. Here, I'll take a picture relative to my voice. So that's at 1 15th, 1 60th. One five hundredth, and let's go to one four thousandth. Really, not that loud. It's not louder than a voice in a room. So, when you're taking pictures with this in a fairly ambient room, no one's going to hear it. So, for wedding photography, for discreet, the uh, discreet street photography, for example, very seldom do people actually notice this thing. Although I did have someone notice <laughs> me take a picture of them from the table next to us at a restaurant a while ago. But whatever, what are you going to say? It's an M. <laughs> they can't get mad at you. It's such a discreet camera anyway. So the uh, shutter would probably be the only thing that I wish it was a little bit quieter. So if you're shopping for these cameras and, and you have the choice between an M10P or an M10 and the price difference isn't too you know, substantial, go for the M10P. If not, the M10 is absolutely sufficient. Uh, one thing that I did have to replace on this camera when I got it was the shutter. So Usually in the first few runs of the M, any M series that comes out with the digital cameras, especially people usually come back reporting some things that wear or break that like a probably didn't foresee. In this case, I know a few people with the earlier models had some shutter problems. So I was doing a wedding with this thing when it was like minus 20 degrees Celsius freezing. And I noticed that my pictures over about one one thousandth of a second were out of sync. So I actually saw the top of the shutter blades in my images. Very, very slightly so, but definitely not something you want on a camera that costs as much as this one did when it was new. So I sent it in for repair. Within two weeks, voila, it was fixed. They put a brand new shutter in. So that's cool. Otherwise, everything else feels as good as it did when it was new. I can't get over that. My Sony cameras, for example, after years of using them, my, my a7R II, for example, when I ordered the M10, the screen gave out. Like, what are the odds? The Sony cameras and other mirrorless cameras just are not built to the same standard that these are, and this is proof. My Sony cameras, the grips start falling apart, the electronics start failing, random, the buttons just don't feel the same. The M10 absolutely feels just the same, and I've used many other M's while I've had this one, many other M10s, they all feel the exact same, with one exception, Leica refreshed the, uh, the scroll wheel in the back here with the M10P. So the P actually has a more dampened scroll wheel than the M10s do. Um, same goes for the M240s before. They, it was a little less clicky than the M10s. Not a big deal when I'm wearing gloves or I'm outside. I prefer the haptic, you know, the, the, the clicky sound that you get out of this thing. But uh, if you are shopping for one and you want a little bit more discreetness, I guess, from your scroll wheel, well, just so you know, the M10Ps and onward have a more silent scroll wheel. I also have a generic thumbs up grip here. I don't even know who makes it. I bought it from Captic 
like somebody sent in a camera and it came with it so i bought it from them and it does the trick i was not an advocate for thumbs up grips until i got one and now i can't live without one so if you want to go down, down that rabbit hole i would suggest it and another thing to note also is the, though the front of the uh, camera on the top plates and the rangefinder patches they don't really build up much dust I did notice once or twice that I did have some dust build up in the front of this and then I sent when I sent it in uh, for that they removed it but it really doesn't affect the uh, viewfinder experience and the back definitely collects dust because below this rubble, rubber gasket here you can unscrew this eye cup here, this uh, glass cover, and that's where the dust gets into it. So it's not entirely sealed off from the elements. It probably has something to do with the fact that it's always rubbing against fabric, against shirts and that kind of stuff, and that's where the dust gets into it. So there actually is a fair amount of dust within my eyepiece. It does not affect anything at all. I'll repeat it. Dust in the viewfinder is a super normal thing. Every Leica M gets it when you use them. It really doesn't matter you can use any Leica with dust in the viewfinder. It really, it's like having dust in your lens. It doesn't matter. Otherwise, I'd say this camera held up quite well. The, uh, the base plates, I usually put some gaffer's tape or something like that for emergencies. So I just took it off before the video. Uh, the clear tape has, is still there. Uh, it's worn out just a bit over time because uh, I put it on tripods every now and then and then just the friction kind of rubs it out. But it's still, it's still there, just collecting a little bit of dust. I do like the, the base plate. I, I'm not one of the people that complained about it, and I'm sad that they got rid of it because it really harkens back to the Leica M's of yesteryear, or, well, they still make them, so the film Leica M's, let's say. And uh, everything's still snug. I, I, I would say this little latch here maybe feels a little more loose than when I got it, but barely. Uh, I like everything about this camera. I love the battery. I have two of them. They're stupidly expensive. And... Everything's clicky and nice. So that's the original finish on the inside. So you can see, maybe there's a little bit of wear to see the difference of, but I mean, really, whatever. So that's that. Now as a professional tool, the M10 has been an asset for me. It makes my files stand out from my competitors and my peers, and I love the images it produces for me. They're super gratifying. When I look at my albums at the end of the day, I always want to go through my M10 files first because they're just so gorgeous and full of life. I hardly have to fix the white balance. Usually I make it a little bit warmer because some people say it and I agree with them for the most part. The M10's white balance is definitely skewed towards the cooler side a bit, but it's usually very accurate. And all you have to do is increase the temperature just slightly. And I'll tell you why it can do white balance better than any other mirrorless camera, let's say. These shutter blades here, they're always on point. It bounces the light off of it and then the camera can generalize based on that. And nine times out of 10, it's bang on. And with the rangefinder, because you tend to focus in the middle because you have to with the rangefinder patch and recompose, that's where you have press your shutter and maintain that exposure if you are using auto exposure or anything like that, or if you're just trying to meter, always meter in the middle so and then move it around. So if you know you're focusing on a high contrast thing or something that's backlit, make sure that you're metering for your subject and not for the background. It's not rocket science. It's something that becomes second nature as you use these cameras. And it has generally worked for me. Very rarely do I screw up the exposure and if i do always 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 underexpose because this camera has extremely good latitude if you underexposed if you're trying to recover highlights if you're someone who likes to shoot overexpose don't do it with the m10 you're going to definitely miss out on a huge amount of uh, image quality potential because this cam this sensor has very very good shadow recovery like most digital cameras do but highlight recovery is zilch. It's not like my backlit sensors on my Sony cameras, which you can just, just screw up the exposure and recover in post. This guy, you're usually stuck getting it right or underexposing it to get any good image quality out of it. So if you have any skies or any highlights that would be very overexposed, make sure you underexpose when you use the M10. So I have a few lenses in my roster, but my main ones that I use for my work are my 21 millimeter Voigtlander, and my 35 millimeter Distagon 1.4 and the 50 Sumilux is spherical. 
this lens is spectacular as is the 35 Distagon. The 21 is also very, very good in its own right. I don't use it as much as the other two because it's not as versatile. But when I'm traveling, I would say that most of my travel shots are done with the 21 and the 50 Sumulux. The 35 Distagon is just a bit too big and it's kind of in the middle of these two. If I only have to have one lens, it would probably just be a 35 Distagon because it does everything and it does it really well. But having these two is kind of fun for variety. So the M10 sensor is really, really good in daylight and that low light. I would limit my, when I started with this camera, I was comfortable shooting all the way up to 10,000, ISO 10,000. Very, very good. It, it, you can use it, although there are a few things to note. Don't miss your exposure because if you have to, oh, if you have to increase your exposure at low light, you're gonna actually probably run into banding in your uh, underexposed areas, as well as a good amount of grain and a decrease in color accuracy. So I've, I treat this M10 like I, sh I treat my film M's uh, as I would with, let's say, an ISO 800 film. I just cap the M10 at ISO 800 when I'm shooting with it. So I'm usually shooting with the manual ISO, uh, leaving it at 200, and then throughout the day into the night, I'll slowly increase it, but very rarely will I go above 800, unless I'm really trying to stop time or I'm using the 21 millimeter because it's a 3.5 aperture. So maybe I'll go into 3200 and 6400. I think stick with the wheel <laughs> because it pretty much lays out the groundwork for you for what to stick to when you're shooting it. Otherwise, I mean, it's really just go with it. Uh, the image quality uh, stays pretty consistent throughout. And I like to stop at 1 60th of a second when I'm shooting with a 50 millimeter, or most of my lenses in general, because anything below that, I find my handheld capabilities kind of dip and I'm very comfortable with this camera up until 1 60th of a second. I do wish that it shot above 1 4000th of a second, but that's where var uh, ND filters or circular polarizing filters come into play if you want to shoot wide open. And now I'm going to talk about how people engage with this camera. So when you're traveling, doing weddings, portraiture, yada, 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 this is a really unique experience because you're not looking through the lens. And it feels, it feels kind of absurd when you have such good lenses at your disposal, like the 50 Sumilux is just gorgeous when you look through a mirrorless camera at it uh, with the lens. So having this on the M10 and looking through a viewfinder and just seeing the lens just in the corner of your frame is kind of like, ooh, uh, it's like, I don't know, it's like having uh, sitting in the passenger seat of your Ferrari. <laughs> Um, but it's only at the end when you look at your files that you really see just how freaking good the lenses are. And it really adds another element to the user experience, which is the same for all, I guess, rangefinder lenses, uh, rangefinder cameras. Uh, it's that there is a sense of vulnerability when you use this camera. And I think it's shared. And I think you're, I'd like to think that your subjects can understand that a bit. And maybe it's, it maybe goes back to the fact that it looks like an analog camera. Well, it really plays out to, into maybe your mind and it probably plays in to how you take your pictures and how you appreciate them. So having that sense of vulnerability, having that sense of engagement, because you're looking through the viewfinder, you're not looking through the lens, you're in the moment still, you can see around what you're framing and you have that sense of in the momentness. So there really is a sense of vulnerability and candidness that you kind of do share, I'd like to think, with your subjects when you do take the pictures of them with this camera, because when you're framing for them, you are, really engage in the moment, you're not looking through your lens, you're seeing around the, th the area and you're able to engage yourself a little bit more. When you're having such a small camera that's really not intrusive, it really comes into play like that. And like this camera really helps shape the mentality that I've come to appreciate of not having, like having a bigger camera it really isn't the uh, end all of being a professional camera photographer. I used to always think that you know, if I was working, I should have a big camera that was imposing so people know that I'm a professional. But shooting mirrorless cameras and appreciating their size and their compactness and my back <laughs> have all thanked me for the new approach that I've taken on. So these smaller cameras are a little less intrusive. They're less intimidating for your subjects. The warm up period that I have with my subjects is definitely diminished because now I'm much more, uh, you know, one of them, let's say when we're taking pictures, you're having a conversation, this small little thing is the thing that's taking pictures. You cannot beat 
mirrorless cameras, but especially these M cameras for their portability. And that's what comes into play when you're doing, when you're traveling, for example, these are really non-intrusive cameras. I just go up to people and I take a picture and I say, thank you if they ever notice. And they're okay with it. It's, it's not like you're walking around with a giant 5D uh, or a 1DX with a giant grip or something like that, where they're really, they feel like you've stolen something by taking a picture of them. With this, it feels like, look, I just took your picture. Thank you. Here's a nice little vintage camera. Ooh, you know, nobody knows what the Leica is. I've had this camera around me for five years. Only recently do I notice or I think that people actually recognize what it is, but very, very, very few times have I ever been called out and someone said, hey, look, a Leica. You know, it's usually, usually you can tell who's gonna notice it too, because you look at them, they look at you, make eye contact, you get the nod, that's what it is. So traveling with this camera, really, really fun. Uh, you, you just feel much more immersed and you take fewer pictures because you take better pictures. With a regular mirrorless camera, I find I'm always taking an extra picture for reassurance, whereas with the M, because you're focusing on high contrast areas, you're much more, with the patch, you tend to seek out things to focus on, and then you, you just, you know you're focusing on what you need to focus on, is what I'm saying. You, you're much more immersed. You're not, you're, you're, your hit rate and your keep rate is much higher with the M's. And I noticed that with my workflow as well, I'll take way fewer pictures with the M's, but my keep rate is much higher with my M10. So now I did, uh, other than the uh, shutter, I did have to do a few little maintenance things. One of them was actually calibrating the horizontal alignment on the rangefinder patch. So that would be the only maintenance thing you'll ever have to do with your M10. And it's really easy to do. Don't send it to Leica unless you really need a CLA or something like that. If things are going wrong because all you need is a small hex, like an Allen key, and you just adjust the patch. It's it's on a um, it's on a screw that you just rotate it slightly, and it'll correct for the pitch of the uh, of the cam arm right here. That's it. It's super easy. I've done it twice since I've had it in five years, and I've taken tens of thousands of pictures. So. That's a testament for the drift that you are apparently, uh, what do you call it, uh, prone to with these cameras. Not really a, a big issue. Unless you have vertical alignment issues, then I would probably just send it out because I don't feel like removing the like logo. But hey, if you're out of warranty and you're kind of handy, take it on. Uh, the other thing that I had a problem with too was uh, in the first year or two, the uh, hot shoe kind of got a little loose when I would use accessories with it over time. So as you can see, as you can see, I put a little piece of paper in the middle of this uh, thumbs up grip. And uh, initially, I was not really down to send out the camera to get that fixed. Uh, so what I did was I took a toothpick and I just pried up the little metal uh, little arms that are on the inside because it's literally just ar this archaic old school design. I don't know why they didn't implement the really good but the cold shoes on the M2s that I have and the M3 that I have. They, they're spring loaded and it's like a vertically traveling, um, whatever, like a pin that holds everything in place. So they kind of fixed the problem when they released the M10P and they came with these uh, matching metal hot shoe covers. They're so sexy. So I actually got one and you can buy these as an accessory and it clicks into place. It's in place, it's so freaking nice. And it, it matches the rest of the paint, so the rest of the uh, black chrome of the camera. Whereas the one that came with the M10 is plastic. It feels so cheap. So if you can get one of these M10P hot shoe covers, get one. If not, just get a thumbs up grip and maybe some paper. <laughs> and, and that's pretty much it. Like otherwise the camera feels exactly the same as when I got it. It's a fantastic camera. It's really, really well made. I am so impressed with it. And it really, and the thing is at the end of the day, is it's inspiring. I still want to pick it up and take it out with me. It still feels just as special as the day I got it. I love this thing. And I love how, you know, slowly over time, it's brassing, so to speak. The finish is kind of wearing out a little bit and it makes it just much more personal. It feels much more than a digital camera to me. It really feels like a tool. It feels personal. It feels like it's mine. And that's one of the reasons why I'm really having a hard time thinking, but will I upgrade it? Uh, down the line, you know, the image quality that comes that this thing produces is so damn good. You, you just it feels much bigger than 24 megapixels. 
but definitely try one of the, these cameras out, put a good lens on it, and really you'll see the pure potential that this sensor has. I put this next to my 42 megapixel images, or even the 50 megapixel images that I've taken with medium format cameras. Initially, actually, when I was testing out the M240 against the Hasselblad, uh, uh, what is it called, uh, the XC, whatever you know what I'm talking about, the mirrorless one, I compared the two, and um, and yes, the Hasselblad out-resolved it, had much better low-light performance, blah, 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 but it's also way more slow to operate, much more cumbersome, and the files that came out of just the M240 with the 35 Sunilux, I was blown away. And so that's what this thing has too. It's got a little, little secret sauce to it. And there's a nice dynamicness to the images, the highlights, the, 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 basically the mid-tone transitions are beautiful with this sensor. You cannot get this with any other system. I really don't think so. The, the files, there is the Leica magic in the image quality here. The lens is part of the part of the system, but the sensor is the defining piece when it comes to your images when it, with the M camera bodies. And the M10 has a truly unique sensor that I've never ever experienced uh, images that this thing produces outside of the Leica M bodies. Really, really gorgeous. Uh, the colors are unique. They feel organic. They don't feel digital. You really just get, get this gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous photos, that, these gorgeous photos that you can just appreciate. And that's why I, that's why you see people shooting M9s. You know, 10 years later, people are still talking about buying and selling like an M9s. So in, in digital world, that's like picking up uh, a D700 right now and selling it for thousands of dollars. It makes no sense, right? Well, something about those sensors, the CCDs, and even with the M240, it still has that magic, you know, that secret sauce too. That's, like a M's are different. They don't follow the normal rules that you have with digital cameras that consumer trend. We talk about color science, and we can talk about all that stuff, but really each one of these sensors are very unique and it's why people buy and sell them and use them all the time. It's a really different uh, camera at the end of the day. So that's my takeaway after using this camera for five years and I'm gonna continue using it. So don't forget to hit like and subscribe and let me know what your thoughts are about the M10 in the comments below.